you very much. Uh, well, <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much, all of you. Uh, uh, most of all, thank you for being here. Thank you for not only your presence in the room, but for your being here. I want to share with you that until about four years ago, I held a thought that ruled the nature of my experience, that fueled the engine of my experience from day to day and from year to year. And that thought that I held was this. I am the victim of the circumstances in which I find myself. And I have very little to do with how life is going for me and very and much less to do with how life is appearing on this planet. And I have to tell you that until about four years ago, I held another very damaging thought. The thought was, what can one person do? There is very little that I can do to change anything anyway, so I might as well give up. And I was on the verge of giving up because I lived in a world that made no sense to me and I was experiencing a life that made no sense to me. I would pick up the newspaper and see things that were happening that made no sense to me. I would look across the room in my own house and see things happening that made no sense to me. Nothing was making any sense to my soul and so I wanted my soul to just get the next fast train out of here and leave. And that moment of desperation caused me to find myself in a most extraordinary conversation with God. And when you have one of those, everything changes. <laughs> or at least it better. <laughs> and, and here's what I want you to know that I learned in that conversation, both told and from my experience thereafter. One person can change the world. One idea can change the world. One thought can change the world. One new movement in a new direction can shift everything for the lot of us, and it doesn't take but one of us to make that decision. And so I decided that I needed to become that one. Now this is a very risky thing for me to say. And for those of you who don't understand what I'm trying to say tonight, it might even come off as being a little bit egotistical, a little bit edgy, a little bit too far out for a man of God. But I come here tonight to share with you my individual truth. I intend to change the world. I intend to change the world's thinking about its right relationship to God and to all that is, and as a result of that enormous shift, change the world's thinking about its relationship to each other and to all the rest of us who form the one unit that we truly and really are. I have been given an enormous truth, a truth so simplistic that for the first six months I was too embarrassed to share it with anyone. Because I thought if I shared it, they'd say, this guy is so naive, he's so simplistic. Boy, is he behind the eight ball on this one. <laughs> but here was the truth I was given, and its implications are so astonishing that they will change the world. The truth I was given in four words. We are all one. There's only one of us. And if we chose to live from that place of truth, and from that enormous wisdom, in every choice, in every decision, in every action, in every thought, word, and deed, everything would shift overnight. Then I was given another truth, perhaps even more astonishing than the first, from a purely physical point of view. It's given to me in two words. There's enough. You see, there's enough of everything we think we need to be happy and the only reason it doesn't seem like there's enough is that with all the wisdom, with all the intelligence, with all the understanding, with all the improvements, with all the forward motion the human race is said to have made, we have still not solved the most fundamental problem of our experience on the planet, 
And that fundamental problem is how to make sure that I don't have to have at the cost of you having not. How to make sure that I don't have to make my home better at the cost of spoiling the home for all the rest of us. And then I was given a third and final truth. And that final truth was this. A spirituality and a belief merely held and not shared, merely held and not lived, merely held and not acted upon is a spirituality not believed in at all. It is a false spirituality. I thought, I thought long and hard about whether I should stand up in public in favor of or endorsing any political movement or any political party. Because it felt like at some level or another I would spoil my credential as a person who was bringing a message that had to do with God's involvement in our life. You can't imagine how many letters I've received. Hundreds of letters from people asking me, how could God have written book two? They got book one and they got book three. <laughs> but how could God have written book two? Because book two deals with politics. It deals with education. It deals with our social structure. It deals with our economic structure worldwide. And letter after letter poured into me saying, these are your points of view, not God's, because God wouldn't have these points of view. What an extraordinary thought that while God is concerned with, involved in, and a part of all of us, she wouldn't be concerned with any of this. <laughs> when I was introduced to the fundamentals of the Natural Law Party by one of the most articulate, insightful, compassionate, intelligent human beings I have ever met, John Hagelin, and when he made clear to me what this party stood for, and when he tried not to sell me on it, never tried to persuade me, never proselytized, simply said, I extend an invitation. Just look to see what we're about. If you disagree, then disagree. But just look to see what we're about. And I accepted his invitation. I read what the Natural Law Party was about. And I could find nothing in there with which I disagreed. Everything said to me, this is the natural way. This is the way it ought to be. Not this is the way it ought to be, in fact. This is the way it is. Yeah. <laughs> and our problem is we're not recognizing that. <laughs> now, in the third book of the Conversations with God trilogy, I ask God a very interesting question. And this is fascinating because I happen to know for a fact John hasn't read book three yet. <laughs> More's the pity. <laughs> but I know he hasn't had a chance to get to it yet, and yet tonight he was talking and I thought, it sounds like he's read my book. I ask God, can you please tell me the difference between society on this planet and the highly evolved beings and the highly evolved societies in the universe? First of all, I asked him, are there such societies? He said, yes, but not here. <laughs> not quite, not yet. See, God has a great sense of humor. <laughs> Better than some of you, obviously. But, <laughs> but, but in any event, I said to I said, if there were a highly evolved society in the universe, what would it be like? Just tell me. And here's the answer I got. It was so simple. It was so incredibly clear, I could hardly believe it. He said, in the highly evolved societies of the universe, the beings have only two watchwords. What's so, and what works? <laughs> Just look to see what's so, and then do what works. And I said, well, we do that on this planet. And he said, I'm afraid you don't. <laughs> You see what's so, and then you don't work. <laughs> you see that what's so is that, for instance, sitting children down for hours a day in front of little white square boxes with moving pictures on it creates a state of mind that causes eight-year-old and six-year-old children to push three-year-old children out of windows in Chicago. You know what the effect of that little box in the corner is 
and you do what works by controlling it and controlling the program that goes on it, right? Wrong. You know what ingesting certain materials does to your body. You know what continuing the smoke will do. No one has to convince you of that. You know the effects of that. And so you all simply stop smoking, right? <laughs> Wrong. You know what despoils your political system. You know what money does in the political system. <coughs> you know what special interests do, and so you eliminate any possibility of that, right? Wrong. And so we see what works and do nothing about it until tonight. For tonight is the beginning of a new opportunity for all of us. It's a chance to recreate ourselves anew in the grandest version of the greatest vision we ever held about who we are. Tonight is the time that we start anew, just as they started anew many, many hundreds of years ago in many, many places on this planet as we have sought to create and recreate and recreate anew our next grandest version of who we are collectively. One of the most astonishing things I was told in conversations with God was this. Every act is an act of self-definition. Every choice is an announcement of who we are individually and collectively. So I've come here tonight to urge you, to encourage you, to ask you at some level maybe even to beg you, make a better choice. I know where your thoughts are about this country and about how life could be lived here. Don't leave this room feeling that because this group, energetic as it is, is relatively small, we don't have the power to change things and change things forever. Understand that we do and that in you rests the power and the opportunity and that this is the magic moment. George Bernard Shaw said it at the beginning. Bobby Keated it before he left because he said it too loudly. And I will say it again tonight. There are those who see the world as it is and ask why. And there are those who see the world as it could be and ask why not. Tonight, be the answer to the question, why not? God is calling you to the grandest version of life you ever felt in your soul. Don't turn away from it. This natural law party is spirituality made political. Let's do it. Mm. Thank you enough for that fabulous inspiration. Harold had said, Secretary of State. How about benevolent dictator? <laughs> <laughs> Something you said really struck me to the heart, and it's really the heart of the party, and it's the heart, I think, of what deeply draws everybody here. That's your realization, which is the realization, I think, of all great sages and saints and poets of all generations, and that is that we are one, there is only one of us, and that has been a deep driving belief of yourself, myself, many of us here. Now it's also a scientific fact. We should be very bold about it. The whole momentum that Einstein began has culminated in the discovery of the unified field of all the laws of nature, the heterotic superstring, or whatever you want to call it. <laughs> but what it says is that if you scratch deep enough into anything, at the molecular, atomic, subatomic, subnuclear, you arrive at an all-pervasive, universal, unified field of intelligence, and that's what we are. It's the ultimate reality and true identity of everyone and everything. So when you say that there is one consciousness, one knower, that is scientific fact, which makes, me, makes it just ignorance of the truth when anybody acts otherwise, acts towards another as you would not have that person act unto you. You look at what's going on in Kosovo, for example, 
and you want to, for, you know, point the finger at Milosevic, of course, but it's, believe it or not, he's got the support of his people. And it's critically important to understand that there is deep ignorance in the world and deep-seated stress, particularly in certain hotspots in the world. The Natural Law Party has the means to address that and basically to apply the ointment of knowledge, you could say, to those injuries so that people spontaneously begin to act rightly. It is a fortunate fact from recent scientific discoveries in physiological and neurophysiological science, cognitive science, brain science, that it's the natural state of functioning of our nervous systems to be unbounded, to be universal, to be global. But when the, when the individual becomes either highly stressed or through an educational system that emphasizes differences and feeds, force feeds knowledge at the expense of development of total brain functioning, we get trapped into a narrowness of vision that allows us to not see the reality through our eyes, through our ears, through our senses, that you and I are one. Because if we can simply see that reality, which is what the brain physiology is really designed to do, then you cannot act in a way that creates harm for your environment and for your society. Anyway, the Natural Law Party believes so fundamentally in education because our national problems really originate there and ultimately will be solved there. So I, I really, really applaud your nationwide campaign to awaken the country. You do it with <coughs> fabulous eloquence and power. It's just terrific to have you among us. I feel a, a tremendous amount of support in, from all of our unseen friends uh, all over the planet and from every millennia that has ever been. It is the finest of the human heart. And that consciousness is right here. And I want to read to you from one of the great spiritual luminaries of another era. When you are inspired by some great purpose, this comes from Patanjali, the author of the Yoga Sutras, and how to live in unity consciousness. When you are inspired by some great purpose, some extraordinary project, all of your thoughts break their bonds. Your mind transcends limitations. Your consciousness expands in every direction and you find yourself in a new, great, and wonderful world. Dormant forces, faculties, and talents become alive, and you discover yourself to be a far greater person by far than you ever dreamed yourself to be. Well, let's dream the dream together with this great purpose that Neil has so underscored and to bring God into politics in a way that works, in a way that is effective, in a way that makes a difference, and that really brings in the kingdom of heaven on earth. I want to ask John to get very practical, to give us some action points, because I want to know what to do in order to make a maximum difference in this evolutionary process. Well, the most powerful thing I think anybody can do, and people will always say, well, that's great, but certainly not me. But don't say that too quickly. The most powerful thing anybody can do is to assume ownership for this party and stand up and be a candidate and a spokesperson for these principles and very thoroughly developed platform, which is just common sense and will receive profound support from the people around you. I rarely had a political thought in my life I was asked to be the presidential candidate of this party because I have some background in natural law and in the attitude of supporting what works, and I did. A fabulous growing experience. It was a crash course in everything, from <laughs> foreign policy to agriculture to genetic engineering and so forth. It was an incredible growing experience. And a lot of that work has been done now for us in the fact that there is a very well-researched very humane, very comprehensive, self-evident platform of field-tested solutions 
You don't have to memorize anything because they're so self-evident, like the idea of prevention of disease and promotion of health, that if you hear it once, you know it for the rest of your life. <laughs> and that's one of the strengths. These ideas are just so self-evident that they're infectious. Once they're out of the bag, you can never recall them and they will inevitably transform <coughs> the face of politics and public policy. So number one, be a candidate. If you don't feel like you're ready to run for the senator of the state of New York, and we do need such a candidate, then think of Congress, think of state senator, think of state legislature, think of something on the local level. It's a fabulous growing experience, and people around you will rise up and support you. That's one thing. Another thing, this is a big state, New York. And what we're formally doing tonight is launching Campaign 2000 in New York, Connecticut, New Jersey, and Pennsylvania. Getting on the ballot in these states, and we've done it before, we were on in 48 states last time, is a Herculean task, but many heads make light work. We need financial support to make that happen. It's about a $55,000 job to get on the ballot in New York. The other three states are easier. New York is incredibly arcane. But we will do it. We've done it before, and it's going to take all of your help. So we, re we need your financial support by being here tonight. You've done a lot already, and we need your continued support very much. Um, we need organizers. We've got party structures in all these states, but they need strength of people, strength of leadership, strength of consciousness. So please don't leave without finding out, for example, from Kingsley Brooks, who's our national chair, what you can do to help in your areas. Every little drop has big results. And while we're making announcements tonight, Neil... Kingsley Brooks. <laughs> while we're making introductions, Kingsley Brooks, by the way, has been a tireless, powerful chair for this party. on as a volunteer job, and he has been at it for years and built this into a national party. Tremendous achievement. Anyone who's been involved in third-party politics knows what it takes to get federal matching funds, to get ballot access, to qualify for nat national party status. It's very difficult. I'd also like to recognize Dr. Mike Tompkins, who's standing there. Okay, great. If I get a number yeah. for you, we can uh, coordinate. Yes, that's easy. Okay. Welcome back to A Better World. This is your host, Mitchell J. Raven, and now we're sitting with Neil Donald Walsh, the author of Conversations with God, books one, two, and three, who is one of the main spokespeople here tonight at this gathering of the Natural Law Party in which we are speaking about and dealing with the pressing needs of our society and the needs to address this in a very intelligent way through politics, through intelligent politics represented in the Natural Law Party. So we're very glad that you're on the show and Thank you. talking, supporting this incredible movement. Yes. What is it in um, your review of the political situation and our human situation that brought you to want to support, of all parties, the Natural Law Party? Well, um, the Natural Law Party is the only political uh, organization of which I'm currently aware that embodies uh, this very same principles that I was given in the Conversations with God trilogy of books. Mm -hmm. Those principles are really very simple, uh, and yet um, politics does not seem to have found the most simple answers to our uh, most difficult questions. They seem to avoid them, in fact. They do, in fact, it seems to me. Um, but the Natural Law Party uh, says uh, simply, let's do what works, and uh, let's follow natural law in determining what works. And, and if we don't know what natural law is, we can discover it very quickly by simply observing. Mm -hmm. So it's a process of observing nature and observing life in all of its many forms uh, on this planet and seeing what works. I'll give you just some very simplistic examples. Sure, we can see that certain forms of our political interactions with each other, both in this country and internationally, are not working and have not worked for hundreds and hundreds, I might even say for thousands of years. Mm -hmm. And yet, in, in spite of the evidence of our own eyes, we continue to want to promulgate and to extend those kinds of uh, political systems. Uh, and we don't seem to find the courage or the ability or the strength or the insight uh, or the wisdom or the clarity to say, you know, this is simply not working. And the courage. Uh, or the courage. This is simply not working. Let's um, change our mind about this and go in a different direction. The same thing is true in so many areas of our life. We see what works and we see what doesn't work, but we don't do anything about it. In fact, we rarely even tell the truth about what is working. What intrigues me about the Natural Law Party, and we certainly don't tell the truth about what is not working, 
what intrigues me and inspires me about the Natural Law Party, frankly, is that it um, does, in fact, observe closely what works uh -huh. in all areas of our life, in our economics, in our educational system, in our society in general, in our political constructions, uh -huh. in all of it, really. Yes. It, it makes a very clear statement of what does and does not work. And then it stands for what works and says, let's just simply do what works and let's not do what doesn't work any longer. Again, I say that might seem like a simplistic political platform, but it's so simplistic that it's elegant in its design. It's actually simple, more yes. than even simplistic, if you... E exactly, that Ex exactly, right. yes, there is a wonderful distinction yeah. there, and, and all great wisdom is simple. Indeed. Now, in the face of our current real situation, where politics, as usual, is based on lobbying, corruption, really, and a perversion of simple truths. How do you see the Natural Law Party actually and effectively interfacing with this world that is really somewhat, actually quite largely distorted? I think that the interface will be one as of a change agent. Um, you know, uh, things have shifted so much in the past 35 years, uh, geopolitically around the world in any event. Mm. And I think that the year 2000 is going to be really the year of massive shifting and changing uh, all over the world yes. in, in uh, our economics, in our politics, in our social constructions, in our spiritual understandings, uh, and in our political realities. So I see that the interface between the Natural Law Party will be one uh, of a welcome change agent. Mm -hmm. But I think that right now the human race has lost patience with itself. And we've thrown up in the window, yes. and the Natural Law Party stands as a um, welcome breath of fresh air. Um, it is a That's way sure. to it, it is a way to take our highest spiritual understandings and render them functional in a political setting. You know, we can't we can't do without politics of any kind. Sure. It's, it's almost uh, it's almost uh, absurd to imagine a any kind of sophisticated social system that wouldn't have some political interaction, some political construction, sure. some political dynamic to it. The question is not how do we get rid of politics, but how do we transform politics to more close to our own highest ideas about mm. how things could and should be. Yes. I see the Natural Law Party filling that role. Mm. Beautifully put. <laughs> I really want to also just thank you so much for your eloquence in discussing with us all tonight uh, the role of one's own spiritual life relative to the larger body politic. I think that is so critically important to point because most people these days, it seems, who affiliate with themselves with something called the New Age, rather loosely or specifically, uh, think that they can kind of exist in a spiritual bubble, in a sense, not related to the actual grounded real world. And it's truly sad, and it's sort of like seed going to spoil, in my mind. I think there's some truth to that. There is a ten tendency, has been a tendency for for so-called new thought people to be uh, somewhat isolationist and to imagine that um, their work begins and ends with the transformation of the self. Well, the transformation of the self is a huge part of the work that is being done now on the planet, no yes. question about it. But I think if we focus only on ourselves, uh, then we, and not on the world at large, then we deny the greatest truth that focusing on the self is supposed to reveal, which is that we are all one and that uh, there is nothing that goes on outside of us that is not in fact directly involved with us and that we are participating in the co-creation of the world that we do not choose to have. We say we don't choose to have it. Yes. So by extending the reach of our transformational activity outside of ourselves, <clears throat> excuse me, I don't see that we are somehow violating the first thought of transformation which is to go within mm -hmm. because to touch the world outside is to go within since transformational thought holds that there is no difference. Yes, indeed, I was going to say. There's no real difference between it and out. It's just a linguistic Exactly, experience. exactly. So, well, God bless you. Thank, Thank you. you. I feel work. blessed and you too. Good. Thank bless you so be. much. And uh, we look forward to, I know you're in a bit of a rush right now, but to have you on um, at greater length so we can talk in more detail. It would be wonderful. Wonderful. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank, Thank you. you.